Hey there, this is Pat Ennis of Ennis Legacy Partners. Welcome to the Exit Readiness Podcast. I'm here with co-host Walter Dial, CPA and tax partner, GRF CPAs and Advisors in Bethesda, Maryland, as well as my business uh, partner, Corby McGordon. He's joining us today. Our mission here on the podcast is to provide you, the business owner, with subject matter expertise on topics pertaining to building sellable business value and for growing uh, or planning your eventual exit from the business. We want to help you build a business that's sellable and transferable and then exit successfully on your own terms and conditions. If you've listened to us at all in the past, you've heard us say over and over that if you have a sellable or transferable business, you'll have more options for exit when you decide to do that. Uh, and a few characteristics, just a few, <clears throat> of a sellable business include a strong strong financial performance, of course, a next level, what we would call a next level management team, efficient documented systems and process processes. And because the buyer is going to be very much interested in, um, in, in or have their eye on future revenue, profit uh, and profitability, in the future. Another key driver is going to be maximizing value through growth and scalability. And so our topic today is four key ways to maximize valuation for a successful exit. And our guest is none other than Mr. Scalability himself, Vern Harnish of Scaling Up. Uh, Vern's a world-leading expert, speaker, author, entrepreneur in the field of business growth. He co-founded the Growth Institute, which is a premier online training company, um, helping mid-market companies in over 50 countries learn and implement the latest in business methodologies. He's founded the world-renowned entrepreneur, uh, Entrepreneurs Organization, EO, as we all know it, and shared for 15 years EO's premier CEO program, The Birth of, of Giants, held at MIT. Vern uh, is also the founder and CEO of Scaling Up and the author of a number of books, including Scaling Up and mastering the Rockefeller habits. He chairs annual growth summits around the world and continues to teach in the MIT-based executive program that he founded uh, years ago. He is a father of four. He enjoys playing the piano and tennis and is a card, this is interesting, a card-carrying member of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. Vern, <laughs> welcome to the podcast. Yeah, uh, nothing up my uh, sleeve. Pat, so. <laughs> We're somewhat Harnish, uh, Vern Harnish groupies here, so <laughs> it's great to have you with us uh, this morning. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, you got it, Pat. So, hey, let's dig right into it. And, you know, I thought one of the things you mentioned, you know, is that steady growth. You know, from our perspective, the, the key number is gross margin. You know, if you can be showing steady increase in gross margin percentage, and your total gross margin dollars divided by your payroll dollars so that they can see that you've been driving around labor efficiency. Mm -hmm. Those are the two really secret metrics. Because, you know, whoever's going to buy you figures, hey, they can really start to juice up revenue. You know, who knows about profitability? Everybody talks about EBITDA. In fact, Warren Buffett's latest letter that just came out, you know, the EBITDA in many cases is what he kind of calls the BS you know, earnings number. Uh, we have what's called EBOT, uh, earnings before owner theft, uh, <laughs> which you always have to back out of anyway. And so, you know, those are all numbers you can play with, but gross margin, yeah. that really tells buyers that you've got control of your business, that you know what you're doing. And if anyone has an earnout, as you guys know, we like to see that earnout tied to gross margin. Uh, performance, not revenue or not profitability. Because again, the buyer can really mess with you on those two numbers, but it's pretty hard on the gross margin side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, very quick question on that. Just in yeah. terms of that that growth, what's more important, the magnitude of the of the growth or the trend? Yeah, it's the it's how steady the growth is. Mm -hmm. And I think Jim College really got it right. The twenty mile march. So I yeah. would rather see a steady increase than these wild fluctuations. Because again, what you're trying to do is, you know, your your value is tied to having created a consistent engine 
in an mm-hmm. inconsistent, you know, crazy world that right. we're in. And so uh, it's it's the tortoise, I think, instead instead of the hare that wins. Yeah. But but also the and and in turn though the magnitude. If you've had a steady uh, greater magnitude in growth, you know, one of the, one of the old rules that I think still applies is your PE ratio is your rate of growth. And mm-hmm. so if you've been growing at you know steadily at twenty percent, um, at some level you deserve that kind of price to earnings ratio. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, so, so when you get the owner that's kind of in their in their groove and they think, oh, this is too hard. I've I've squeaked my margins as much as I can. Uh, how do you how do you respond to that type of posture? And what can they do? Yeah. Well, one of the things is that uh, mid market companies are sloppy. Um, we've you know they don't think so, but you know one of the indications is just. Revenue per employee, you know, the average revenue per employee, you know, it varies wildly for industry, but on average, it's about 126,000 per employee for companies, 5 million to a billion. The fortune 500 is something north of 600,000. And so these big bureaucratic bloated, what appear to be bloated organizations are five times better at driving a dollar revenue per employee than most of us. And so we just find that there's, you know, a lot of slop within these mm-hmm. businesses. In the book, I share Ken Sims' uh, company, Nurse Next Door. You know, when Ken just had 28 employees, uh, some, you know, his head of payroll comes in and says, you know, Ken, I'm dying around here trying to keep track of all these nurses, you know, that we have contracted out. I need some help. And he was growing at the time 100% a year. And Ken said, well, you know, why don't we bring in kind of a lean consultant, Mike Martin? And a year later, they doubled, literally they doubled in size, but they added no additional people to payroll. Incredible. And the woman leading it said, hey, Ken, I wouldn't have believed if I hadn't seen it, but I barely have got 30 hours, what was 80. So they literally doubled with half the time. Same thing with franchisees. They struggle bringing on one franchisee a month. Once they leaned it out, they could bring on five. So uh, Mm -hmm. there is an absolute, a lot of slop. And by the way, I'm encouraging every entrepreneur to read the latest Walter Isaacson book on Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. And I love Elon's idiot index, where he'd look at things and say, why does this cost so much? Why does this take so much time? And I don't know about you, but I think as American citizens, we ought to be angry as all get out. I mean, here he's put more things and people into space in the last five years than all countries combined in 50 years. And he's Mm -hmm. done it for one thirtieth the cost, not 30 percent less, one thirtieth the cost. Mm -hmm. And so, look, if he can find that kind of slop. Uh, we can find another 10%. And I don't know if you guys saw, but um, last year, GE was the best performing, you know, industrial firm. Their stock doubled, the valuation doubled, uh, mm-hmm. outperforming Apple and Microsoft. And the key is Larry Culp. Larry was a former CEO of Danaher. He's mm-hmm. now come over to be the new CEO of GE. And the big thing is they went, he went in bringing lean into the organization convincing people that you can't just get 10% better performance out of this process or equipment. We can get 50%. Mm. And so, and with AI, what we're seeing in all aspects of the small to mid-sized companies that we coach, you can gain 50 to 100% productivity improvements in customer service, in your software development, in every aspect of the business. And so, uh, but let's go back. Uh, yeah. Hey, Vern, I got a question for you, Vern. Yeah, please. So, Vern, we, we, you know, the the title here today is Four Key Ways to Maximize Valuation for a Successful Exit. That's yeah. one of the chapters in Scaling Up. It's 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 your exit chapter, really, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, and, and like you, we like to leave folks who are listening with some actionable you bet. Uh, uh, things. And I think you, you you do a really good job per usual of in that chapter. And, and it 
it was inter interesting because we mostly hear you. We know yeah. you as the growth guy. We know you as scaling up. So it was fun to, to, to just see you, you know, connect that to exit, of course. Yeah. And um, so what? Let's, let's go over those four key things before we run out of time here, because we yeah. could go in Got all it. kinds of different directions with you. What, what, start with what's number one? Well, number one is that you become, as the owner, redundant. Look, as the owner of the business, your number one job is to drive valuation. And ultimately, that means to drive yourself out of a job. Because if you are, the company's dependent on you in order to have this kind of performance that you're getting ready to sell, then that drops the valuation considerably. And so that's really the number one thing that you've got to do is work yourself out of a job. Hey, Vern, can I ask you follow up on a question on that one? Yes. So, you know, in your Rockefeller habits, uh, which is also a, you know, something really useful for people. Um, the first one talks about the executive team being healthy and aligned. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of our clients, they don't even have an executive team. So from your perspective, is a CFO the first person you would add to kind of start fleshing out your executive team? Or does it depend on the industry or does it maybe depend on issues you need to address within your own business? Yeah, uh, I really think it's the COO or head of operations. I mean, if mm -hmm. you want to think about Steve Jobs and Tim Cook, you know, mm -hmm. Steve could dream up the iPhone, but Tim Cook can make sure 20 million showed up on a on a Monday. And so who is your right number two that okay. makes sure that all the processes are in place to drive the gross margin that we're talking about? So that's the person that you need to make sure that whoever's buying it, you're possibly able to leave behind uh, to help run the company. Got it. That makes sense. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and hey, hey, Bernard, another question related. Uh, what we find too, we work with a lot of founder-led businesses. Yeah. And so, boy, one of the toughest things for them can be to to get out of the way and let the management management team if they do have one or if they they listen to us and they start to put one in place yeah it's hard for them oftentimes to change their role and just and really kind of change who they are what do you have any thoughts about that piece yeah you know there is the key transition you know when you launch the company your weakness is the weakness of the organization so the first person i hired was a part-time bookkeeper almost to your question about cfo a neighbor of mine across the street, uh, Claudia Smallwood. And uh, she really passed the three tests that everybody on your team should pass, which is they shouldn't need managed. If mm -hmm. the people you've got around you need managed, you've got the wrong person. I didn't need to manage her. I just sent over the numbers and it magically got done. Number two, can they get you to where you're going to be? You know, they got you here, but can they get you over the next 36 months? And she could. But the biggest test is the, they wow you. And even Claudia would just say, hey, Bert, I remember the early days when my husband was starting and launching a company. I don't want to interrupt you too much, but I'm seeing some things in your numbers that might be of interest to you. And I'm like, wow, Claudia, even my outsource executive, my EA from the Philippines, Jean, she wows me a couple of times every week. And that's my EA. So... If you don't have people around you that are wowing you, but once you cross, usually it's 30, 40 employees. I don't know what size companies you guys are helping to exit. You know, you kind of cross a two, three million dollar mark. Whatever is your strength will become the weakness of the organization. So if you were the one that was responsible for driving all revenue, that'll start to slow. Because you're now trying to wear two hats. You're trying to be kind of the CEO and head of sales. If you were the operational genius, all of a sudden your gross margins start to slip. If you were the R&D genius, all of a sudden you start slipping in innovation. Whatever was your strength will now become the weakness. And that's when you've got a critical decision. Are you willing to really spend more than you ever thought you'd spend for a person that's going to replace you so that you can really step up and step out uh, and work 
more on the business strategically. So mm -hmm. that's the short of it. Yep. Yeah. Got it. Good. Thank you. Yeah, we talk a lot of, a lot on here about owner centricity and yeah. how that's got to diminish. If the if the value is going to increase, you as the owner have have to decrease. That's right. uh, okay. So that's number one. What's what would be number two? Number two is understanding what is the constraint within the industry. And, and by the way, it goes back to gross margin. It's what sucks about my business. What is mm -hmm. shitty about this industry that we're in that everyone has just accepted that this is the way it is. And if you can get control of that, then it creates tremendous value. You're going to sell the company for a lot more than any multiple of EBITDA moving forward. So I'll give you an example. You know, we've got a client, Virtual Technology Corp. At the time, they were building simulation systems for uh, our military, and they were growing rapidly. And long story short, they realized that the constraint was was labor. And mm -hmm. so they put a focus on just hiring 16 of these specialists that were hard to find. Anyway, they got them locked up. Raytheon came along and bought their company for a gazillion dollars because they had locked up what were the critical labor. If you've got just the right location, let's just take a restaurant. You got the right location in town. Um, that's worth a fortune versus if you don't. Um, mm -hmm. If you control a key component, if you have the right reference client uh, in a particular industry, or you've got the right five reference clients, that can be worth more than the next 50 clients that you've got in that industry. If you've got a key piece of technology or capability, if you've got a, a useful trademark, what is it that you have got, what we call a Rembrandt in the attic, what is it that provides? So I'll give you an example. We have a staffing company, 3 million EBITDA, sold for $90 million, uh, 30 times earnings <laughs> on 3 million. But it's mm -hmm. because they had figured out, they had outsourced to Vietnam uh, the labor necessary to scrape LinkedIn to get roughly 3,000 candidates at any one time for this particular niche of labor needs in a marketplace. And the company came along and bought them because they had that all set up and was working brilliantly at a tremendous cost savings in the industry. Uh, I've got another buddy, um, Randy Amon. Randy had a company called ABL Electronics. They built cable assemblies out of Baltimore. You know, they were, you know, mm -hmm. the 10, 10, 12 million, you know, at the time, but there was this hassle of, you know, taking a lot of uh, energy from his people, just putting quotes together. So they automated that and let the customer self-serve. Well, that saved them like a million bucks internally. $2 billion company came along and bought them for a gazillion dollars saying that'll save us tens of millions. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what is a constraint that you can... Uh, fix and out. In, in your article, you mentioned the soft soap guy and, and how yes. he did that, which is great. But is what I hear you saying that even locally, if you're in a local market space, if you can yeah. do that same kind of thing in your local market space and solve the one big rock in your shoe to start with, yeah, that's progress. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, hey, if you've got the right three or four prominent people in your town mm. that are on your advisory board. Look, back when I had founded this Association of Collegiate Entrepreneurs, I'm a college student. But mm. when I went to Chicago to run our event, I'm like, who's the biggest name in Chicago? The Pritzkers. Mm -hmm. So through the local university I was working with, I got them to get the Pritzkers to just loan us their name mm. on our piece of stationery. Once I had the Pritzkers, I got the next four. And I remember you guys, you know, you probably remember the Dick Bucca days in Chicago. Oh, yeah. sure. Dick had this bar that was the hottest place 
all I did was send over an email, a letter. This we didn't wait for yet, email, letter. And down the side, I had the Pritzkers and several other prominent names. I got everything I needed <laughs> uh, because we had those names associated. Mm. If you had Pritzker uh, and but and Butkus, <laughs> that's you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, it's all about where is the constraint in the industry and can you get control of it? Jim Cook. Boston Beer, Samuel Adams. You know, Jim used to teach for me every year at that MIT program. I mean, he decides he's going to launch a beer. You know, his promise is we want to be the best tasting. And the key to it was the best hops. And mm -hmm. there's a little spot in Bavaria that has the best terroir and all of that. And he locked it up. He owned it. And one of the big guys tried to come in and steal it from him. And because he's got the access to the best hops, he today owns 2% of the beer market. But back then he was just getting started as one of a gazillion local brewmasters. Okay. And that's how you create valuation. Okay, so become redundant in your business. Yep. Gain, gain control of an industry constraint. That's yes. number three. Number three then is find an internal 10X advantage over the competition that by the way is pretty invisible to the market the one that i talked about under strategy the customer sees it they they know that you've got they see you've got pritzkers you know mm -hmm. name associated with your local activity and so my buddy john ratliff he's our partner runs our global coaching organization today he was in the call center business and there, the standard is 200% turnover of your staff, right? It's just accepted. That's just the way it is. It's, it's a terrible business, low margins. And he found a way to reduce that to 18%. Yeah. Uh, there was the internal 10x advantage over the competition. And it's related to what is the constraint that we looked at from a strategic standpoint but it gave him a tremendous advantage when it came to gross margin. The average cost, he figured it was about $5,000 to replace an employee. Right. If you can reduce it from 200 to 18%, plus once he stabilized his workforce, it stabilized his customer base. I mean, you think the turnover employees is bad in call centers. It's even worse with customers. I mean, I can get anyone in the world to answer my phones. And as a result, he was able to take an industry that averages 4% profitability to 21.8%. Five times industry average, which is really the measure of a great company versus a good privately held family-owned business. And he sold for 14 times earnings in an industry where he bought those for three times earnings. Right. Uh, so where is this 10x advantage you can find. And again, we saw it with Elon. They would have a valve that cost $1,200. And Elon's like, what he called his idiot index. He's like, I think we can make that as they did for $30 yeah. instead of paying $1,200. And you've got those kind of 10X opportunities throughout the company. But if you can find the main one, that's a tremendous uh, valuation driver. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. And then finally, number four. Well, number four then comes back around on the cash side, and that is, do you have consistent growth? Yeah. Uh, of particularly, I like to look over the last 36 months, which direction has your gross margin percentage gone? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we see happen is the minute companies gets to about 3 million in revenue, three, four million in revenue, all of a sudden they wake up and their gross margin dropped by 4%. You can almost count on it. It mm -hmm. went from like 57% to 53%. And you don't even really notice it because revenue may be covering up some of your slop and you grab your financials, you look at the top line, you look at you know the bottom and you ignore the middle number. We like to see if you can add 4%, instead of lose 4%, that 8% difference mm -hmm. in your gross margin. And so John Ratliff is a call center business. The average gross margin that comp that industry is about 35%. Mm -hmm. 
he was running in the 60% gross margin level. And again, in a crappy business. And so we had software like margins um, that then is why he was able to command such a high valuation. So, mm -hmm. and, and it was consistent. That's what people are looking for is that consistency and performance. So it's people, strategy, execution, cash. People you need as the owner become redundant. Strategy, find the constraint and get control of it. Have the right location, the right talent, the right reference customers, uh, the right exclusive with a supplier uh, where you get to distribute it and nobody else does. Those are some variations. Then number three, figure out what is in the way of generating great, great gross margin and fix that problem if you can by a factor of 10. And we see it all the time. And then last, uh, drive consistent performance. And those four will add tremendous valuation. You know what, Fantastic. that is a phenomenal um, summary. All right. And so let's just, it, it, and we promised you 30 minutes. So it, before we wrap up though, we're gonna, in a second, we're gonna ask you if there's it, what you wanna pr promote today. There's all kinds of things you can promote, but what yeah. you wanna promote. And if someone wants to reach out, if you wanna provide contact information, but before we do that, uh, any final final words of wisdom for, for listeners? Yeah, you know, the, the big the big thing that happens as companies scale up, even at the small end, is they start adding management, managers. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're cleaning out. Nobody wants managed in the 21st century. We've got a client that provides trailers at gas stations. And they they operate in the five states of Australia. And they mm -hmm. had a state manager. And then they had two people underneath the state manager. The person making sure the trailers are repaired. And somebody was making sure that the relationship with the gas stations was good. After he heard me speak, he just got rid of the five state managers. He's like, you know what? Why did I ever put them in the first place? They're expensive. They're just mm -hmm. frustrating. The two guys I have in each state run in the place. He mm -hmm. took half their salary, took it to the bottom line. The other half, he split with the other two. And so you don't need people working on work. You just need people working. And that's one of the places that you can really begin to kind of clean out uh, and improve your gross margin uh, and profitability within the business. So if you're small, don't be throwing people at the problem. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, thank you. What today would you like to promote? Well, we have a new book out called 12 Habits of Valuable Employees. And if you want to drive the valuation of the business, it's important that you drive the value of every one of your people. And I think the analogy, if I'd end it, uh, end our talk is, you know, the question I ask business owners is, what's the number one goal of every Olympian athlete, Olympic athlete? And they always say goal. No, 99.9, 99% 99 of Olympic athletes are not crazy to think they even have a shot at a medal. Their goal is personal best. And you can't scale a company with one employee of the month, one salesperson of the year. You need to help every employee you've got, the five or the 50 or 500, to achieve their personal best every day and every week. And so our two books, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits or the Company Habits, and 12 Habits of Valuable Employees is the career habits. If you can get every one of your 550 or 500 employees to just absorb those two little thin books, it can drive tremendous valuation and take a load off of you so you can become redundant in the organization. Excellent. Okay, and so if, you, um, if someone listening wants to reach yeah. out, how would they do that? Well, scalingup.com. Mm -hmm. And you'll see a link that shows you can go right to the books. All of our tools are free, so they can download theirs. And my email is easy, burn at scalingup.com. Excellent. Vern, thanks. Thanks for joining us. It's great to have Mr. Scaling Up with us today. Right. Uh, and uh, listeners, if you want help maximizing the value of your business or planning your eventual exit from the business, 
You can reach Walter at 301-951-9090 or myself and Corby at 301-859-0860. And you can access resources at both websites, grfcpa.com and nslp.com. Thanks for listening. And until next time on the Exit Readiness Podcast, this is Pat Ennis and Walter Dial signing off.